Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the FRCS teaching this Wednesday, uh, 5th of September. Um, we have David today, um, David Hughes, who is uh, presenting, uh, he's been very brave actually to take on this very difficult topic of talking about the nerves, anatomy, basic sciences, and neurophysiology. And we appreciate uh, that as very, very good of him. Uh, we have also with us Shwan, as always, supporting and uh, helping with uh, running the session. And uh, today also we have one of the senior mentors who has always been with us. Even he, you know, he's not appeared on these webinars before, but he's always with us, supporting us and advising and um, helping us set up everything. So he's behind the scene working uh, Farhan, Farhan Said, who um, works in Coventry now. So welcome Farhan. Uh, he will have some hot seat viva questions also, which will be very interesting. So just some housekeeping uh, issues. If anyone wants to talk or have a question, you could write it in the chat uh, box or raise your hand symbol next to your name. If you also would like to take part in the Viva, it's on first uh, come first serve basis. Uh, again, there will be limited number of questions. So please, if you're interested in taking part in Viva, uh, we encourage you to, uh, to make best use of this opportunity and please raise your hand symbol so I know you and put your name down. Um, so I will leave it to you now, David, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So um, we're talking about nerves and neurology for the FRCS. So I'm going to re do a review of the anatomy, um, a bit about nerve injury. I'm afraid I had a bit of an issue with my with my presentation. So this, the slides about repair are sort of are, are missing, I'm afraid. And then I've got a bit more about neurophysiology. So we'll talk a bit about nerve conduction studies in particular. So sort of um, to get you aware of that because. I, I had a couple of questions on in the exam myself with this, and it's not the best time to find out about it in the exam. So it's a good way to sort of as a warm up for you guys. Okay. So obviously, in terms of a ner the nervous system, it's into a functional way. You've got your sensory and your motor, um, and we understand those. These are sort of basic principles, really. Um, these are a few things you might get thrown at you in terms of somatic and autonomic, uh, sort of voluntary and involuntary. And obviously, again, visceral sort of receiving inf uh, information. Okay. Now, um, this is a pet hate of a lot of examiners. They might ask you to draw a nerve, and everyone starts drawing an axon. So this is what they mean by a nerve. So they want you to talk about the different structures of a nerve. So the epineurium, the endoneurium, the, bund the, the bundles, connective tissue, the blood vessels. So if they ask you to draw a nerve, if you start drawing a spindly thing with, a, with dendrites, you're going down the wrong route. They might give you a subtle hint, you know, a nerve rather than an axon. Okay? So that's the key thing. And remember, the components of the nerve are either your motor and your sensory. All right? So it's, a, it's, it's almost like a, I always think of it as a fiber optic cable with lots of little bundles within. Okay? Again, here's a bit more detail with regards to a nerve. So they may start saying, so the individual bits. So you, it's good to have that ready. And that is a very easy starter question in, 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 on this basic science table. Please draw a nerve, okay? And we ask you about um, an axon. So again, this is again, some candidates will end up drawing an axon when they say a nerve, but this is what they, they're quite, they be quite specific, okay? So uh, in particular, um, they may want to ask you some questions with regards to nodes of Ranvier and in terms of uh, sort of conduction velocity around, around that. We will talk about that a bit later. Now, a term that often comes up in neurophysiology is orthodromic, and that means the correct direction. So, this is a sensory nerve. Um, so, I'll get my arrow. The sensor, so, you're, so the, the signal is going that direction. Okay, sorry, I'm getting all the way. Sorry, motor nerve. The signal is going that direction. And likewise, again, if I show you on the sensory nerve at the bottom, okay, so it's going that direction. All right? 
And then we talk about antidromic, that's going the opposite direction. So this will come more apparent when we're talking about nerve conduction studies and EMGs. Um, we tend to do more commonly antidromic uh, nerve conduction studies when we're, when we're testing to see the nerve. Okay. Right. And again, the key sort of thing is you types of axons. You've got your myelinated axons uh, and your unmyelinated axons. Uh, and so it's all about with regards to the, sort of, uh, the skipping to allow the, the speed of the of electric uh, uh, nerve conduction. Okay. And again, I, I think you've seen this in um, Raman Chanran. You've seen all these pictures of the different types of groups. If you understand there's a different, that there are different groups, they'll get quite bored at this stage. But don't worry, don't go too much into too much detail about this. They're more interested with regards to nerve injury. So we want the, your, your classic is your sedin classification, neuropraxia, axonomesis, and neurotomesis. Okay? So a peripheral nerve injury, so that's what we're classically going to see, maybe a neuropraxia generally. It's a non-degenerative lesion of a nerve characterized by a complete or partial failure to propagate an action potential, i.e. a conduction defect along the nerve, resulting in a motor or sensory loss. So your carpal tunnels, your cubital tunnels, your crush injuries. And again, these are the classic things that are usually caused by compression, ischemia, can be reversed if an injurious agent is removed. So tourniquet time is very important. The nerve remains intact. And the key thing is Wallerian degeneration does, should not occur. Okay. Uh, again, usually the stimulation of the distal segment will evoke a response. The motor action potential expected is going to come back by day 10 recovers by remyelination of the distal segment. It can actually take a two, to, uh, two to 12 weeks to recover. So it does take time. Um, the assumption that the lesions in neuropraxia rather than more severe can sometimes lead to delay. I mean, these are all things you need to be aware of. If you're going down this route, you're doing quite well. Uh, potential diagnosis to make in a if particularly if there's persistent pain, which would suggest that the in the angel there's still a, 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 a block to conduction. Um, the, the diagnosis should not be made in the presence of a strong tenels test, which indicates the axons have been ruptured. Okay, so these are things that they, they, they will, will get you good points in terms of if they are pushing you further on the neuropraxia. Okay, now an axon tomesis is a disruption of the axon and its myelin chief and the supporting structures, the Schwann cells, the endoneurium, perineum, and the epineurium remain intact, okay? So it's the axon and smile and chief that's damaged, okay? And it's usually, again, the result of severe compression or crush injury. Wallerian degeneration occurs distally and proximate to the closest node of Ranvier. Repair is by a combination of collateral sprouting of less, in lesser injuries, and axonal regeneration in more severe injuries. The latter occurs very, very slowly at one to two millimeters a day. This is the question they may ask when you get a nerve conduction report that says axonal uh, damage. They want to know about Wallerian degeneration. They want to know that it's going to take a long, long time for the nerve to recover, okay? So again here, as I say, nerve conduction studies will show a loss of conduction in the distal segment quite quickly, three to four days after the injury. Small or absent potential uh, compound muscles may show some action potential. EMG studies will show fibrillation potentials sharp and sharp waves at the two to three week, which talks about axonal loss. So these are things they might talk about in the viva. Um, degree of recovery depends on the age of the patient. With any nerve injury, the younger the patient, the better the chance of recovery, and also the amount of fibrosis that has occurred at the time. Right, neurotomesis is a complete disruption of the peripheral nerve by any means. So that's your um, amateur surgeon cutting a median nerve doing a carpal tunnel. Simple. But very rare, it might be a laceration, deep penetration injury. Um, and in this case, the Wallerian degeneration will occur distal to the lesion, 
induction studies show a loss of conduction at three to four days. EMG studies show fibrillation potentials, again, two to three weeks. The only sort of surgical intervention is to repair the nerve or whether by direct suturing or grafting at the time of the injury. Or we've only got a three to five day window, to be honest. Uh, and then the next option would be to consider um, uh, whether you need to do a, a, a graft. I'm not a plastic surgeon. I'm not going to talk about that today because it, I get confused. But if you, again, this is something you talk about in the, inter, in the exam with regards to having a multi-team team disciplinary approach to, get, to help you get there. Okay. So it's just a sort of talk, talking about where the sedan classification um, comes in. So we've got our neuropraxia, which the old Sunderland was called type one. That is all that conduction block. Then your axonomesis, ax axonomesis can be subdivided into two, three, and four. So you've got your axonal discontinuity, which is type two. So axonal discontinuity and endoneurus, endoneurium disruption is a type three. Perir uh, perineural disruption and fasciscal disruption is a type four. And neurotomesis, everything's discontinued. Okay. And this signifies. Wallerian degeneration. So you can see Wallerian degeneration, Wallerian degeneration in all of those. But that's just meant to say axons. The axon is intact. All right. So that's the key thing when you're talking about these. Again, just another sort of de demonstration of how the axon works. So in terms of um, you've got your disruption there, compression, your sheath, your sheath is lost. That's what we talk about your axon and loss, the disconnection, and you can see. This is the Wallerian degeneration occurring here. Okay. Again, we talked a bit about axonal regeneration. Uh, that can happen with severe um, disruption. And you can see you've got your degeneration here, the, the loss there, cut there, everything's being broken down distally. And, but occasionally you can get a bit of um, Wallerian uh, external regeneration with, with adjacent nerves, uh, so, and that can take a very slow process, which tends to happen for people, okay? Now, uh, one of my exams, I did, I was given a nerve conduction study to talk about. That was in the basic science thing. So it is something that will come up. Um, it's worth when you're in your hand clinic or when you're looking at a, or, or talking to a hand patient, or, or if you've got a carpal tunnel on your list, looking at the, um, at the nerve conduction studies, just to familiarise yourself with it, so you can know what sort of, what you might get thrown at you. Okay. Typically, it's a. They may say, "Why do we do it?" it plays a key role in evaluation of patients with neurovascular disorders and also peripheral nerve injuries. It also can help, importantly, in people with um, brachial plexus injuries, um, it can or any other sort of uh, severe injury. You can look to see if there's any changes or improvements. And there are some key things we're worried about, sort of F-wave and H-reflexes, okay? So nerve conductions and EMGs are different from the core, or the core of electrodiagnosis. These studies are performed usually, um, are usually performed first and usually yield the greatest sort of diagnostic value. Um, if performed and interpreted correctly, they can help us really work out what things are, but they are not all the be-all and end-all. Um, we still have to think of our clinical scenarios. That's the key thing. It's marriage of both of those. I do know it's somewhat controversial at the moment with the whole um, um, sort of NICE and uh, NHS England talking about we don't want to do carpal tunnels anymore, but they still need to be done because in terms of preventative um, uh, degeneration of the nerve, they are important for patients. And we're going to be using these a lot more in order to justify doing these. Okay, um, so I don't really need this one. Okay, so nerve conduction velocity is an electrical diagnostic test. It just provides information about abnormal conditions. The nerves are stimulated with a small electrical impulses by one electrode or another electrode detects the electrical impulse downstream from the first electrode. This can either be orthodromic or antidromic, so reverse or straightforward. Okay, so again, on the basic science table, they may ask you to draw a, 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 a nerve conduction velocity or a nerve, or a nerve wave. And the key thing is zero is here. I know I've been a bit naughty, 
they do that, quite a few textbooks do that, so it's important that you remember. If you see something like this, it is, that's not zero, zero is up here. So we're starting the resting potential of minus 70. I hope we all know this. And you've got your stimulus supplied, eventually gets the, at 55 is the threshold, which creates the huge voltage rises to go to plus 30. This is millivolts, not full volts, thank goodness. And then voltage still flows, and then you have your repolarization. They might ask, why do you have repolarization? So we understand that. This is a question I think we'll, we'll ask in the Viva, because I want someone to talk about it. And then you're returning to your resting potential. Uh, I haven't got it on, on, on here, but they may also want you to talk about sodium and potassium levels in terms of what's happening here. Uh, but so that's, that's something you need to think about as well. So that could be the second. I could ask you to draw this and then ask you to talk about the sodium and, and potassium uh, flow. Okay. So we need to know a few things with nerve conduction studies, the distance between electrodes and the time taken for impulses to pass. And that helps us in terms of working out the chance of speed of transmission. Slower than normal could indicate damage from direct trauma, demyelination, uh, diabetic or peripheral neuropathy, viral nerve. But the key thing is we're worried more worried about carpal tunnel. Okay. So an EMG is basically the same thing, but looking at the motor response um, and it's looking at what's produced by muscles. Um, a lot of the time we do get both of those and it's quite easy to get confused. And it's about the tiny amounts that are generated by the muscle cells when they're activated by the nerves connecting with them. So there's several types, uh, intramuscular and surface EMGs. This one we use as most common is the intramuscular one. Uh, involves inserting a small needle into the skin. Sometimes you can see the surface ones when we look at them in the clinic. I don't know, we used to have them, but they're not very accurate. Um, and that hopefully detects a muscle impulse as well. Sorry, that was not supposed to happen. Apologies. Let me go back to where I'm supposed to be. Okay. So here we go. Sorry, apologies about that. So here we have an anti, um, a sensory one, a median nerve. This is typically. Um, Antidromic, right? Yeah. So we've got our little, our little um, sort of sensory pads here, passing a signal there, and we're looking at at the wrist, at the elbow, at the axilla. Okay. The signal is going this way. That's why it's antidromic, and we're looking at sort of the responses there. So you can see as we go further back gets less because hopefully the signal is, is being dissipated a bit more. Okay. This is antidromic, as I said, and this is orthodromic. So this time we've got our sensors here. And we're sending it along here. This is the distance and we're measuring them. Uh, so it's, sorry, stimulus, sorry, wrong way around, apologies. Stimulus is going, it's going stimulus is going this way. We're measuring it this way. Okay. This is orthodromic sensory because this is the way the signal is going. All right. Motor conduction, this is sorry, I get confused with it. I apologize about it, that's why. Um, so this is going to be orthodromic again. So the um, signal is going that direction because that's the way the because the muscles are, are distal, and so we're looking at that response again. So you can see with higher response there, less and less as we go further away. All right. Um, so this is an example of a sensory one, that you might see, okay, surface sensory one. And, and this is the usual spots where they may put it for um, the carpal tunnel, okay. A reference point active in the ground, that's usually what they have. I found a couple of these, they're very confusing. Um, and as I say, I didn't, uh, it looks really good when it works, but it doesn't work very often. I don't know if Farhan remembers when we did them at Warwick a few times with Ike. Okay. So, looking at the risk, so we're looking at a uh, nerve conduction velocity. This is proximal stimulus. 
going along this route. So the elbow, we might show a little spike there. That's the, that's the stimulus. Okay, your resting potential going, creating getting the threshold, causing a response. And that is our latency period. Okay. Now, these are key terms that they're going to ask you in there. So they want to ask what latency. Latency measures the time between the stimulus and the response in milliseconds. This is sort of basically the, talking about your speed. Okay. So D1, that's, the, that's going to be our distance, I think, isn't it? If I remember correctly. Yeah. Right. So that's our next one. This is just sort of the formulas you may work out. They have different things, but the key thing is remembering latency is measuring the time between the, the onset of the stimulus to the time of the stimulus res, uh, response. Okay. Okay. So this is a classic one with a median nerve. Uh, these are, are very complicated. I don't, wouldn't worry too much about them. Now, um, some of the ones you may have. So we're looking at peripheral nervous systems. So we're going to have a, a, either a motor nerve conduction, a CMAP which is a stimulation of peripheral nerve while recording a muscle that innervated by that, that nerve. And then we've got a, a snap, which is a, a sensory nerve conductioning. And that is a stimulation of a mixed nerve when recording from a mixed or spontaneous nerve, classically your ulnar nerve or your median nerve. These are the terminology that they want you to spout out at the time. So latency is the interval between the, the onset of stimulus and the onset of response. And amplitude, is the maximum voltage difference between the two points it is proportional to the number and size of fibers that are being depolarized. And it basically equates to how good the quality of the response is. Um, and it tells you how good that nerve is. It could, have, it could have a good response, as in a good latency, but if it's got a small amplitude, it could be still being crushed. Um, duration, again, the time from onset to termination. Uh, total duration is talks about the dispersion of all components and it measures the difference in conduction in the nerve fibers. Then you've got your overall conduction velocity, which we're talking about the speed at which the nerve fibers are carrying the electrical stimulus sap, uh, between the two sites. Comparison of conduction between two segments of the nerve can help us localize a lesion, which is why we look at the wrist, the elbow, and the axilla. So if we've got a normal speed at the axilla and the elbow and a reduced speed at the wrist, the meat in the median nerve that we know is carpal tunnel rather than something at the elbow or the rib or the axilla. Okay. So our typically our, our type of um, uh, ones are going to be our antidromic ones for the sensory ones because uh, it, we're looking at um, sort of stimulating the nerve and classically usural and these are the usual ones we do usural, ulnar, and median nerve. Um, and typically, we're looking for peak latencies, conduction velocities, and the amplitude in those situations. And that tells us, as I say, those are the key things. So how quickly they're being, the stimulus causes, causes a, a response, and how much of a response is generated. Those are the key things. So speed and quality. Motor conduction studies, these are very much in terms of telling us if there's any axonal degeneration, so demyelination, so damage to the axon. Um, typically, they're gone from proximal to distal, evaluate for conduction velocity, looking at block, things like that. Again, ulnar and median nerves are classic the ones. The other ones that we, we, we can do, but you, they're not that's really above and beyond for this exam. Now, these are ones they may ask. What type of wave is this or reflex? So an F waves and the H waves, they're rare, they're useful for helping identify demyelination. And um, when there's a motor, and usually on the motor can EMG, so if there's amplitude of greater than one millivolt, and probably depending on the patient type. So what is an F wave? So we're looking at that sort of response to the dorsal ganglion, so the horn, that's the dorsal ganglion, and that's the H reflex, okay? So they look at proximal roots and the antidromic resp motor response to the anterior horn and spinal cord, orthodromically to the muscle. It's a pure motor test. A prolonged asymmetrical F wave is suggested of a proximal root lesion, 
and it's clinical uh, is sort of best application for vaxopathy uh, in terms of we're talking about the prolonged demyelination uh, and mild external injuries. Less sensitive than EMG or radiculopathy since we're only looking at a short segment there. Okay. So that's what they might show you. That's your C map I talked about earlier, the motor action potential, and that's the F wave response. This happens a little bit further along, but that feedback loop that's happening in that picture. Okay, so it's that feedback loop. Okay. But okay, as I say, is it's just it's just a pure motor test. It helps us identify demyelination. Okay, these are some abnormal F waves. It's not coming in as it should do, but you'll be very lucky if they show you that. Again, the H reflex, a reflex loop, orthodromic, so going in the direction of the flow of the, of the sensory and motor, so motor and sensory, uh, is very good for radiculopathy. Um, and median nerve at wrist are recording a flexor copy radialis, apparently. Um, and it's typically a unilateral delay absent will suggest a problem. Once abnormal, may not normalize, so don't worry about it. Often absent in people with lots of polyneuropathy. So anyone over 60 or someone who's diabetic. Right, so that is your wave. That's the H reflex, a little bit later on. So these are just some of the techniques they might talk about. Me uh, being a a needle being inserted to the muscle, disposable, single use, and typically multiple muscles accessible examination. If you, I don't know if you're at a teaching hospital, if you can, go and have a look at a nerve conduction study um, and just so you know what you send your patients for. Okay? And it's basically looking at activity, intentional activities, spontaneous activity, motor unit configuration, and experience back. I don't think they'll ask you too much about that. But just to sort of show you. This is what you might, these are some of the things you might get. To be honest, this is again, if you're getting to this point in the five, you're doing quite well. I'll move, for, move on. I'll take one for the knee. Uh, no, don't have to worry about that. Okay. This is one thing I was going to ask about. They may also, sorry. They may, this is another thing they may talk about in um, the nerve bit, they may ask you to, talk, to draw a neuromuscular junction. That's, we'll talk, that's for another topic for another day. But we may talk about that in the viva bit, so there's not very much to talk about in the viva for nerves, yeah. questions-wise, but this is a key thing as well. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, brilliant, uh, David. Thank you very much. I Just to refer, I think um, Shwan has given a nice, um, talk when we first started this uh, webinar teaching about um, the neuromuscular junction and uh, how the complex process works um, and it's on YouTube channel and uh, Shwan has promised that was very great of you uh, David uh, we know you are not a neurophysiologist but I think you've reached uh, that level so if you are electro engineering then obedience but actually it does pop in the exam a lot yeah. And it's one of those suddenly the examiner suddenly seem to know everything about electrophysiology for some reason. Um, they do have the answers in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember that. It's unfortunately something you, you have to memorize. Uh, it is useful for clinical practice, particularly if you're going to, into an upper limb job or, uh, or so on. The yeah. the problem is with this type of topic is you you don't you don't use it in your everyday practice. It's only when you've got a nerve conduction study and you're in a busy clinic you want to uh, you just want to read the report of the of your colleagues and say that uh, okay yeah we're going ahead with the median nerve compression. David is correct. Please take the opportunity to actually study what a nerve conduction study looks like because some you will be given a, uh, a sheet of paper with sometimes just the waves drawn on and they'll say what what is this and what is that and sometimes they'll give you the numbers and so on and they'll say what it, can you interpret this without any of the interpretations from your neurophysiologists um, so do take the opportunity to do that 
Second, it's worth going over this topic a couple of times. Watch uh, David's video uh, when it goes up on YouTube the second time, so it's a bit more solid. Get the definitions down correctly. It's a brilliant presentation. Well done, David. Mm. I think that I agree. This presentation contains everything you need to know. Uh, you just have to listen to it again and again for three, four times to record everything because it's a lot of information there. And you need to, but I think you got everything you need there. The, all the terminology to use, that you know, the buzzwords, um, the differences of between nerve conductions and uh, uh, EMGs, uh, the waves, the different waves. They do ask all these questions, unfortunately. You might be surprised, guys, but unfortunately, they do ask them very frequently, uh, even in part two of the Viva. So, um, um, and yes, they asked to draw a nerve, so you could uh, pr start practicing from now how to draw a cross section of the nerve. Um, it is very simple, but and you could um, uh, answer that easily if you have practiced, but you have to practice in advance. Any comments uh, from you, Farhan? About yeah, this? Uh, for me, it is one of those topics where I would put it down as to be revised a day before exam. You won't be able to revise the whole thing, but Individually, if you are making notes, make sure you write down what are the 10, 15 topics which you want to revise before your exam. And for me personally, this is one of those topics. Yeah. I think people might feel a little bit uh, out of depth at this, but but don't don't worry. None of us knows much about North Induction Studies, more than that's what this lecture. Yeah. And uh, so please, if you have guys any questions, um, come forward but uh, we will um, we don't encourage you to but uh, we're gonna have some viva in a minute I, I just want to reassure you if you can start talking if you can say some of the terminologies the definitions like latency amplitude and what they imply by that you're doing you're going to do well in that 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 section they're not going to expect you to be a neurophysiologist if these if you look like you've actually understood it and you've read it a bit out of it you're going to get a good six seven hopefully um, it, it's, 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 we're orthopedic surgeons. We're not comfortable in this. This is why I said, I put my hand up and said, I'll do it. Someone has to do it because it is something that was a bugbear that's back through me. And I just want to make sure it doesn't throw you when it comes to the exam. Yeah. I think these days they're encouraged to ask about the clinical implications of everything. So they'll, they'll ask you, when would you do nerve conduction studies? And when we do EMGs, um, and give an example, for example, for each one, when, when you do it, uh, to make it more clinically oriented question. Um, so that, that could be something to look into. Um, I don't know if you, David, uh, have you know, any quick answer to that. Well, um, it, the reality is it's different. Uh, most of the time, you will be get you'll get a combined a combined nerve. So you're going to get some a median nerve. So you will have an EMG and a, a nerve conduction study. The key thing is, you will, if there is axonal degeneration, so the axon is damaged, axon demesis, you will see demand, you'll see changes in EMG, which is important. Um, but for to, if, from a clinical point of view, in terms of recovery for the nerve. So that's the key thing. Yes. As I say, the rule of thumb, you, you always get a bit of both. You always, you rarely, a, a nerve conduction study is only really important in pure radiculopathy, but it's very rare we ask for those. I mean, we're not, neuro, neurologists tend to be the guys, and neurosurgeons tend to be the guys who ask for those. Um, that's the only time you get a, 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 just a pure nerve conduction study, but for the most part, you get a combined sensory and motor or your combined peripheral nerves, your median nerve and ulnar nerve. I think the one fact that uh, sticks to my memory is uh, with the EMGs uh, as the one useful clinical uh, use of it is in the cases of radial nerve palsy following um, um, humeral shaft fractures. Um, and seeing fibrillations on the EMGs is a sign um, that the nerve is recovering. Yeah. So um, 
I think I try to remember something useful about EMGs, and I think that's that's the one fact I could remember that's oh, related yeah. to physics. So, um, so that's good. Okay, guys. So, uh, any more questions? Um, that's fine. Move on to hot seats. That's good. So we'll move on, guys.